Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Melinda Fakwade, and I am a writer, and I'm the Associate Culture and Features Editor over at Vox. Today, I'm joined by Tom Standage, who is the Deputy Editor of The Economist and the author of several books, uh, history books, including A History of the World in Six Glasses. And we're also joined by Noah Rothbaum, who is the half-full section editor at The Daily Beast and the author of the upcoming book, The Oxford Companion to Spirits and Cocktails. Um, thank you guys so much for joining us. Um, and thank you, especially to the members of the council for tuning in um, from wherever you are. Um, I'm on the East Coast, so it's five o'clock here. So I've got a glass of wine. Um, hope all of you at home have something to drink too as we talk today about wine, spirits, uh, beer, and the history of alcohol. Um, so happy drinking hour to everyone wherever you are. Um, and good to be with you, Tom and Noah. Cheers. Thank good you for here. having us. Cheers, everyone. Cheers. Good to see we've got representation of beer, wine, and you've got spirits, right, Noah? I do. I have some uh, single Excellent. malt scotch. So uh, from, whole waterfront from... covered. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love that we have everything covered here. Um, but so to kick things off, um, I want to pose a question to both of you, which is kind of a broad question, but um, is the overarching theme of our talk here today. Um, and that question is, how has alcohol's rise um, how did it kind of begin? I know like it goes back to biblical times, like medieval times, like, there is so much we could say, but if, if we could sum it up, how did alcohol become such an integral part of our social and cultural world? Um, and I'll start with you, uh, Tom. Um, so it's very old alcohol. It's probably at least 10,000 years old. Um, probably starts with beer, except it's not quite this kind of beer because this has got mm. hops in it. Um, the first beer would have been discovered by accident rather than made on purpose. Uh, because people would have made um, basically sort of soups in, uh, in you cook them in the stomach of an animal. You don't need pottery to do this. You need pottery to make wine, but you don't need pottery to make beer. And when you're lobbing in grains and fruit and stuff like that, if you leave it overnight, if there's any of it left over, it will start to ferment naturally uh, with, with natural yeast in the air. And if anyone kind of tried it a couple of days later, they might have discovered that it tasted rather nice and it made them feel good and relaxed and so on. And then one, one, when people started to notice this, they were like, well, how can we do this on a more regular basis and in larger quantities? And so they started making beer. And you see beer everywhere in the world. Um, you get different people in different parts of the world fermenting different, whatever the grain is locally. So they, you know, they make it out of millet um, in China. They, uh, they're using wheat and barley in the, in the Middle East. Uh, in the Americas, they're making things out of, out of corn. And so there's just different um, things being fermented wherever you look and making beer. Um, and I think the important thing is we raised our glasses at the beginning. Um, that's a sort of ancient echo of this 10,000 year idea that when you raise a glass, you're invoking the magical power of, of the beer. It's got this sort of supernatural alcohol has this supernatural effect. It makes people feel good. It's a social drink, but it also has this sort of importance in religion. And so what probably happened is that um, it took on this significance. And uh, one of the theories about the adoption of agriculture and why people switch from hunting and gathering and a nomadic lifestyle to a settled lifestyle, which happens about kind of you know, 10,000 years ago, um, is that they wanted to ensure that they would have a regular supply of beer. And the way to do that is to live near fields of wheat and barley, either wild ones or start planting your own, and then you can start gathering things in and, and making beer. And beer is very, very important in the earliest civilizations, places like, um, uh, you know, Mesopotamia and Egypt, they're all drinking beer. Everyone's drinking beer all day, even the children are drinking beer. <laughs> and um, it really is a universal drink. And so um, and when we bring our glasses together, we are um, we are symbolically reuniting our glasses because the earliest uh, drinking was out of these big pots that they used to ferment it in and you drink through straws. So it was a social drink as well. So this idea that beer is the kind of honest drink of the of the, you know, of, uh, at the end of the day, you've done your work, you've earned your beer and you go down to the pub and you see builders drinking beer. The b builders of the pyramids were paid in beer as well. So it, these are all very, very ancient ideas. And I think that's why um, alcohol continues to have such an important role um, in our societies obviously other drinks subsequently came along your wine and uh, and spirits and other things as well but i think this idea that um that alcohol has magical properties and it has social properties is ultimately why it has uh, been so central in in culture and that has also then um enabled it to sort of transform history in lots of different ways it's not a coincidence i don't think that the mesopotamians the first people to mass produce beer uh they're the people who um built build the first cities invent writing uh, 
um, they distinguish themselves from the hunter gatherers who came before who didn't drink beer and they say look at us we're civilized we live in a city we have writing you know and uh, and we also have beer and that's the difference and one of the um one of the mesopotamian stories is the story of enkidu this is in the epic of gilgamesh the oldest epic poem in the world um and uh, it's the story of uh, basically a, a sort of wild man and it's a folk memory of the idea that the um that the hunter gatherers were not civilized because they moved around and once you become civilized so and how do they make him civilized they basically give him beer nine jugs of beer he drinks the beer and he becomes a man um and he's then civilized and lives in a city and drinks beer and that's kind of you know so they were very very you know they really are bound up together and that's reflected in the story final point the oldest written recipe in the world is also for beer uh because one of the um, ancient uh mesopotamian uh poems hymns uh has the story of how somebody made a, a feast for his father and in the process he makes beer and so the steps of making beer are, are written down there so it really is incredibly old and incredibly important and shaped history in all sorts of ways well i, I think what, one, one of the things that you touched on tom is about kids drinking beer and, and part of it was that people you know one of the first steps in making beer is boiling the water right and and obviously we know that now that boiling water kills a lot of bacteria so that like you know, obviously people who drank beer or other, you know, uh, cider or other beverages, you know, inadvertently were drinking something that, you know, all the bacteria had been killed. So those people were healthy, whereas the people who were drinking water sometimes, you know, would get very sick because there's all types of things, you know, all types of bacteria and harmful things in the water. So it's, it is, it, it sounds kind of counterintuitive, but it was actually quite healthy to drink the beer given some of the water sources of the time. Um, and then also what you were saying kind of about the origins of beer similar to origins of spirits, you know, a lot of the original distillers were um, really alchemists who were looking for the water of life. And a lot of the terms that we still use today for alcohol really mean water of life. So aqua vitae is the Latin, um, which becomes in the Gaelic ishkabaha, which is bastardized to our modern word whiskey, which means water of life, obviously. You know, eau de vie, the French term means water of life. Vodka is, is little water. So, I mean, they knew that alcohol, these these original distillers had some kind of, you know, preservative properties, right? It seemed very magical, right? And you can put things in alcohol and it, you know, they can they can last for a long time. But obviously, I mean, it it it, it wasn't exactly the um, what they thought of water of life to be. <laughs> um, but you know, um, you know, then becomes almost recreational. But even you know, for hundreds of years later, even in sort of the modern era until like the turn of the century, a lot of brands are touting their medicinal benefits, which is no longer allowed, at least in the U.S. So a lot of the brands until really the Pure Food and Drug Act of 1906 has passed, a lot of the key parts of their marketing is that it's supposed to, you know, cure spleen pain or, you know, uh, you have all these things we, you know, there's a thing in the Oxford Companion about rock and rye, which turns out to be kind of the ivermectin of, of when it came out, to, you know, it was a sort of this cure for diphtheria that people thought. And, you know, the first whiskey to come in a bottle in America is Old Forester, which comes out in 1870, right from the, you know, sealed right from the distillery. And it's, it's marketed to doctors, not because doctors are good drinkers, but it was because, doctors would prescribe alcohol for a range of maladies and they could never be sure at the time of the whiskey that they were prescribing that it was so cut and diluted and there are all types of you know weird things that you know that were called whiskey but actually turned out to be kind of neutral grain spirit sort of like vodka but colored with like creosote and all types of harmful things so they could never really tell if the stuff that they were prescribing would do more damage than then you know they hurt the people more than they already were so you know that's why old forester came in a bottle so it's i mean it's very interesting the sort of medicinal crossover with with alcohol that that we see for for really centuries and centuries i want to go back to what you said noah about it being the basically the water of life like i love i love that phrase like it's definitely something that is like for centuries and centuries captivated our lives and like the way we think, the way we go out socially um, and like all kinds of people. And I wanna talk about um, like wealth and status as a signifier um, with alcohol and how that has kind of been passed down in history. Um, you know, if, it is, if people believed it to be the water of life, like it only stands to reason that like, of course, like this would be something that symbolizes wealth and 
prosperity. So can you talk a little bit about that? I, I mean, I think it's really interesting, you know, how we view different types of spirits or even brands over time, right? And that, and that really changes, you know, with, you know, almost generationally and also, you know, uh, you know, from, from almost, you know, each century to each century, like, you know, in really now we think of, you know, things like cognac as this fine spirit to be sipped in like a snifter, you know, in like a fine crystal glass where really up until like the 1880s, cognac was, it was used for all types of cocktails. It was sort of, you know, that was one of the standards as well as, you know, port was, you know, very popular. Sherry was very popular. And then you have a thing, this little aphid called phylloxera, which comes from America and it destroys the vineyards all across Europe, right? It sort of turns the whole wine trade upside down. Um, cognac, sherry port, obviously are all made from grapes. They're completely disrupted. And for the first time, really ever people in in london and in england um and and in other parts of the world kind of start to think okay what else can we drink we're really thirsty and people in london for the first time really look to scotland and say okay we we've heard that you make whiskey up here (laughs) we've heard that it's good and you know alfred barnard you know is sent up who's a journalist and writes this amazing book where he visits all of the distilleries in scotland and ireland almost as a report for all these thirsty English people who can't get their normal port sherry and cognac. And really that also changes the sort of, sort of our perception of a lot of these spirits where, you know, now we don't really think of cognac as a cocktail spirit, although it works perfectly in it um, in all types of, you know, concoctions, you know, from a delicious mink julep, which we now make with, with whiskey where, you know, Jerry Thomas, Jerry Thomas writes the first bartender's guide in the 1860s, and he has several recipes for the mint julep, which also had medicinal roots. It comes from, you know, where the UK, where it was originally kind of a medicinal drink, leave it to Americans to make it recreational. Um, but, you know, the julep, you know, he lists several recipes for the julep in his, for his bartending guide, and, and whiskey is only like the sixth one. And, you know, cognac and brandy are kind of the king's gin, which we now, at least in America, we think is a very, Tom will probably correct me, but we kind of think of it as a very aristocratic English drink, you know, like very high class. And obviously, you know, there are parts, you know, periods of gin drinking in England where it's a complete disaster, where it's almost, I mean, English people probably would not like this, but, uh, you know, almost kind of like the meth of you know england oh totally know, yeah absolutely like yeah the gin <laughs> craze was a complete it was a complete disaster but um, but actually this idea of the social status of the drink needs to you know the social status being bad up a drink is again very very ancient um beer starts about ten thousand years ago wine starts about seven thousand years ago seven and a half thousand years ago wine is made in um starts off in the mountains of what's now iran and in both mesopotamia and egypt um it could be brought into the country and then it's made in small quantities but um uh it basically was only available to the very very rich and so the idea that wine was a higher status drink than beer that was the drink of kings as opposed to beer which was the drink of the common man is very very old and um in fact, the Mesopotamians referred to beer, sorry, referred to wine as that excellent beer of the mountains. So they thought it was a very good kind of beer that was made in the mountains. Wine and beer tasted a lot more similar in those days because there was no hops in in, uh, in beer. But then what happens is in, under the Greeks and the Romans, um, they are in parts of the world where wine cultivation, vine cultivation is much easier. And so they, they have this massive explosion in their wine uh, production. And they then look down their noses at the, the civilizations that came before them, the Egyptians and the Mesopotamians, as barbarians where everyone had to drink beer all the time and only the ruling classes got to have wine because in in greece and rome everybody drank wine I mean, even the very poorest people even the enslaved people were given really bad wine but they were given wine and so that was one of the ways that the greeks and the romans sort of thought that they were better the other thing we get from the romans is the idea that um there's a ladder of of like qualities of wine and you see this in pompeii and the pubs it'll say for one you know for one ass which is a coin you can have this sort of wine and for two you can have this and for three you can have this um and you know the the emperor had the best wine of all which was falernium and the emperor's physician galen uh, br- you know took it upon himself to do the biggest wine tasting in history where he goes into the imperial cellars of the richest man in the world to find the best wine because if he's going to make medicine he might as well use the best wine uh, but my favorite example from the roman period is from um, it's actually from the late roman republic there was a big civil war going on and there were always civil wars going on in the roman republic and um 
a, uh, a general was on the run and he went and hid in the house of a of a of a state of a soldier who had, had served under him before and he went and sort of said you know, i'm on the run uh, they're trying to get me can i hide under the stairs in your house and the man said of course of course you know um and so they hide him in the house and then the the man who's hiding him sends his servant down the road to the wine shop to get a wine that befits the status of his illustrious guest and the wine <laughs> the wine merchant is like why are you buying such a fancy wine this is you don't normally buy this wine what's going on and the um and the servant says well we've got you know rather a rather an important visitor you know, say no more say no more um and this is what gives the game away and the um the uh, soldiers who are chasing after this guy come into the house and, and decapitate him and it's given away by the fact that it's um, absolutely unacceptable to serve um somebody of high status uh, the wrong wine it's like the boss comes around are you going to get the two buck chuck out i don't think you are so um, that again is a roman idea that the drink you know the st your station in life should be matched by your drink and we 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 still have that idea today um that, that's, that's like that's... <laughs> that's an incredible story um, it, it, i want to tie that oh. into an another question we actually um have two uh questions that are kind of similar coming in from one is um from leah alexander and another is from sam um leah alexander's question is at what point did alcohol become a point of a, a target of puritanical scrutiny and sam's question is what impact did prohibition have on alcohol standing in the world? And would we have a different world today if prohibition had continued uh, to the present day? I want to tie it in here because, you know, you say yeah. it's, it's tied to certain stations <clears throat> of life and like your status and things like that. But then at, then there also came a point where like there was a huge movement for like no one to have alcohol. Of course, like, you know, speakeasies and things like that, there were people still having alcohol, but like it being tied to like morality um, and things like that is super interesting. So I, I think there's a common misconception, at least in America, that like the temperance movement starts like with prohibition, where in fact, this is like, that's the pinnacle of the movement where it starts, you know, way earlier. It's not just in America, it's all over the world where you see people advocating for temperance to, you know, where, where they, you know, where they're pointing out the ills of, of alcohol consumption. And I mean, I, you know, it starts even in Europe, earlier right i mean that's tom i mean that's you know it, it's on both sides of the atlantic and uh, you know and, and in america we see like it, it kind of um some of the states going dry well before prohibition um you know trying to experiment with different forms of prohibition um and then you know some states go dry before prohibition starts and continue to be dry through prohibition and even you know one of the questions i'll, I'll just well, it's why you get Coca-Cola, right? Coca-Cola right. is because where, where, which state was that? That's in the 18th. Yeah. yeah, right. So there's, you get prohibition there earlier. So what's his name? Pemberton, who invents Coca-Cola. Yeah. So he, previously, he's selling red wine laced with cocaine. That's his drink. Right. That's what the original Coca-Cola <laughs> is. And they're like, you can't sell that anymore. It's got alcohol in it. So he's like, oh, no, what am I going to put the cocaine in now? <laughs> so he makes up this new drink, right? And it's totally because of local prohibition. And of course, then you get big prohibition in the 20s. Um, the other thing is, uh, this is, a, is this a myth, Noah, that a lot of the um, the, the the leading lights of the, the, uh, the sort of you know, prim and proper women who were leading the prohibition movement many of them were taking patent medicines that were like 40 percent abv well that i mean that was a real thing i mean that was you know i, I mean it, in america you get this amazing coalition of people you know advocating for for temperance you know you have you know suffragettes who were you know demanding you know the the right to vote you have people who are against domestic violence since, you know, there were very few of any laws on the books about domestic violence and, um, you know, violence in the home, which is obviously important. But then you also had people like Henry Ford, who was a giant anti-Semite and, you know, a supporter of like the America First movement and the KKK who saw prohibition as a way to take away viable jobs from immigrants since, at least in America, like a lot of the alcohol industry it was a lot of Jews who had come over from Eastern Europe and, and Germany who were, you know, um, involved in the liquor industry. There were people, you know, from all over the world. And, and a lot of the kind of the, you know, there's America first white supremacists of the day saw prohibition as a means to sort of undercut these people and drive them out of the country to deprive them of an income. So, I mean, it's, it's this wild coalition of people who you know, advocate for a prohibition who would probably never be on the same side of any issue ever again, or, you know, and, 
you know, and, and it obviously kind of falls apart as, as prohibition, you know, is a disaster in America. And, you know, we pay personal income tax in America because of prohibition, because in order to convince, you know, the senators from, you know, the states, you know, who, who were not in favor of prohibition, because part of the reason was that the federal coffers were filled with money from taxes from all the alcohol companies. So in order to like make up for that, they were like, fine, we'll pass a personal income tax. And we still pay that obviously, since even though, uh, even though, you know, it's now legal to make and sell and transport alcohol again. But I, I mean, I think the question about would the world have been different? Yes. I mean, it destroyed our alcohol industry. It destroyed, um, the bartending craft, it changed the perception of America of, of drinks. We lost so much as a society. I am very jealous, Tom, of, of, of England and a lot of other countries who, who never lost their kind of their culture of, of drinking and all of the, the history and the norms. It also created, you know, real like gangsters in America. It, it, it made organized crime organized. I mean, prohibition turned small time crooks into organized crime and, and in many ways corrupted, you know, many levels of, uh, of the American justice system. I mean, it was just a complete disaster. I mean, I, I don't know. It, I think I that's, where to begin. That definitely, <laughs> I, that's a part of like the conversation or uh, the history of prohibition that I think gets lost like a lot of the time, especially oh, like sure. in American schooling, it, they kind of just teach it as like, Oh, like people didn't like alcohol anymore, so they oh, were right. against it for a little bit. Or, or, like, or they, or there they don't so mention, many reasons. They don't that mention that, for that, it. that the government started poisoning people on purpose to, you know, dissuade them from buying bootleg alcohol, which only, you know, somebody found out about like twenty years ago. So, I mean, which really did happen. Um, there, there's also another myth on the other side that you often see reported in magazine articles, and newspaper articles, and books was that. Prohibition was the golden age for cocktails, right? We all think of Jay Gatsby and his parties from, you know, the Fitzgerald book. And it was this amazing time of creativity. And in fact, like, that's not true. <laughs> like very few cocktails are invented during Prohibition. And, and the only ones that are like, there are very few, they're, they're usually made in, in, in like the UK or other parts of the world. And it was actually like really a terrible time to be a drinker. I mean, obviously, you know, it was illegal to hoard alcohol before prohibition. You know who else was and, against pre okay. against alcohol, and that's the oil companies. So in the eighteen eighties and eighteen nineties, people are starting to build automobiles, and they're like, "What are we going to fuel these things with? We better have to use oil because we're going to run out of oil. There's not much oil around. <laughs> Why don't we use ethanol? We could use alcohol distilled from crops. We could use all the leftover crops. Oh, for and sure. so there's right. So people are starting to say, you know what? This would be a sustainable way. So there is a road not taken, which is the U.S. Um, you know, the, the US adopted um, gas powered cars because the US was the biggest oil supplier in the world at the time. And um, and so the oil industry was like, no, this would be terrible. If you used ethanol to make um, to make uh, fuel, then uh, we'd be out of a job. But also everyone would drink it. You'd have all of these uh, these <laughs> distilleries making this deadly stuff. And the distilleries were like, no, no, it's fine. We can just, you know, um, denature the alcohol. So you can't actually drink it. But, uh, but, but, the, but the oil industry, they managed to, you know, um, <laughs> basically shut it down. And uh, what was the, there was a tax that came in after, it was a tax that was imposed during the civil war um, on distilling. And, um, and they were trying to get rid of it so that, because this was mean, this meant that alcohol as fuel was much more expensive than, than gasoline, uh, and if you got rid of this stupid tax that was introduced as a as a temperance measure in the eighteen sixties, then um, then you might have had you know American mm. cars powered by uh, powered by biofuels and, and, for the whole twentieth century. And, and was, you wouldn't have had the America going into the Middle East. I mean, and, you know, I want to um, I want to take it back to oh. um. Oh, I'm sorry. I just want to. Mm. I want to just to keep us on track. I want to take it now. You mentioned like the oil industry, and like um, we mentioned like all these different facets of life that alcohol has affected um and its history and i want to take it um to the now and discuss kind of how the alcohol industry looks today how it's grown and like i um as of right now uh, the global alcohol industry is worth over 1.49 trillion dollars so like it's still one of the most influential sectors in the world sure. um let's talk a little bit about like what that looks like right now um and how it differs from the alcohol industry of the past. 
Well, the I main mean, thing is it's it's big companies making this stuff. So I I happen to have made this beer at home, um, but you know people who brew their own beer they're kind of crazies, right? Um, what's been great <laughs> is the last the last sort of you know few decades we have seen this explosion of microbreweries and and that sort of thing. And you know if you live in a city, there's probably a few um, you know local breweries that you can get beer from. Um, we have a, a growing wine industry happening here. But you know in the old days, um, you know you would buy you you would get beer made locally or you'd make your own, um, and you wouldn't buy it from a you know a giant corporation that, that made it made sure it tasted the same everywhere in the world now there's something to be said for beer you know the fact that hey heine can taste the same everywhere in the world like coca-cola is kind of nice when you're in the middle of nowhere and you want a beer um but uh, that's really the big difference that this is wasn't an industry uh, a sort of organized industry on that scale before it was lots of much more small scale producers for most of human history and in fact it was people making uh, making their own drinks in their own homes I mean, I think we've we've seen over the last really, you know, for for distilled spirits and cocktails, like over the last twenty odd years, like a tremendous rebirth, right? In in nineteen seventies, you know, especially the whiskey industry, you know, kind of reaches its its high sales point, in, in and then kind of it's thirty years of straight, you know, declining sales, and you know, it's, it's sort of a dark period where you know a lot of the things, at least in America, but in a lot of places where you know, classic cocktails, whiskey were really kind of on the precipice of disappearing forever, like rye whiskey, almost totally gone. And now, you know, for, for years, the distillers are making it one day a year. They now make it one day a month. Right. I mean, but, and, and rye is, you know, despite what the bourbon folks might say, rye is America's original whiskey. It was the whiskey that George Washington made Oh, I'm a bourbon, bourbon man bourbon. every time. I'm afraid. <laughs> yeah. Rye gives me Rye gives me a different kind of a, a weird kind of hangover. Actually, I don't know if you find that. I, I think bourbon. that's yeah. I mean, the scientists always claim that it should affect you the same way, but I don't think that's true. I think alcohol, def, different alcohols, definitely affect yeah. you different ways. I do like <laughs> rye, but, but yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. I hear you. But a lot of bourbon has rye. I mean, that's the thing. It, it only needs to be, you know, it's mostly corn, but it's a little bit of malted barley and and usually rye. Maker's Mark obviously has a little bit of, of wheat instead of rye, which makes it a little bit sweeter and smoother. But really, I mean, it's, it's one of the amazing, you know, rebirth, you know, um, stories is of spirits and cocktails. And that's a lot of that growth has come at the cost of big beer, you know, where, where a lot of the big beer companies have lost market share to both wine and spirits in America. And you see this amazing rebirth of cocktails, which is, which is powering a lot of the you know, the, the sales and uh, really around the world, people are, are making fine guys, not just the US or the UK, but all over the world, people are once again making, you know, cocktails and spirits where, where alcohol is legal. And I also, I want to ask you both um, on behalf of our audience at home, um, what consumers should be thinking about when they make their alcohol purchases, whether they're like at the grocery store or like when trying something new, what's so, some of those takeaways that you would uh, tell our audience about what they should think about next time they're at the liquor store or the wine store? Well, I, I mean, in America, I think one of the effects of prohibition is that most of us drink out of fear, right? It's that moment in the <laughs> restaurant where like nobody wants the wine list. Nobody, you know, uh, everybody orders a cocktail that they've heard of, but they don't really understand what it is, but they know it's totally defensible and no bartender is going to ask them questions. And, you know, and I think that's really horrible, you know, like we should drink, you should drink what you like, like enjoy. Like, I don't think, you know, you should be judgmental about what you drink, what other people drink, drink what you enjoy. And, and I'd really say, you know, kind of, you know, start to really think like find the bar where the bartenders are, are kind and they're patient and, you know, explain to them what you like to drink, what you don't like to drink. You know, do you like bitter things? Do you like sweet things? Do you like fruit? Do you like things that are carbonated? Do you like tonic water? Do you hate tonic? And, you know, like given those kinds of preference, they should actually be able to find stuff that you will like to drink. Like drinking should be enjoyable and shouldn't feel like work or you know you shouldn't you shouldn't dread yeah, absolutely. it should it should be an exploration it should be an adventure so i mean i'm a massive wine nerd so everyone gives me the wine list but i know what <laughs> i know what i like and don't like because i've tried lots of different things and when you find what you like then you kind of dig into that it's like any subject you just yeah. dig into that thing so i hate saving your blog so just never give me a saving your blog but, I'm sorry, but there are other kinds of wines i don't know but um but i mean <laughs> other kinds of wines that i know that i do like and then i kind of get really obsessed with well why do i like this one more than that one oh because it's got a slightly different blend or it's been made right. in this way and then 
Um, and then it's just kind of, um, but it's just the exp exploration of there's so much stuff out there and you can, um, wherever, we, wherever you are, um, uh, you can always get hold of uh, drinks from around the world. And it's just an adventure. It's a way of sort of vicariously traveling and, um, and discovering the, you know, the different traditions and the different cultures and the different ways that things are made. And if you then get to go to the place where it's made and, and uh, you know, see it in person and, and drink in person, you know, wine, wine tourism. I've long done wine tourism in California, in South Africa, in, in Italy, in South of France. Now this summer we weren't able to to travel this summer, so we uh, we spent two lovely weeks um, just going in and out of London to the, the emerging wine country south mm -hmm. of London now in Sussex and Kent. It's fantastic. Oh wow! Uh, and there's you know the wines are sparkling getting better wine. and better. They're beating champagnes in blind tasting. The sparkling wines are great. Some of the still wines are getting quite good. The reds are still pretty awful, but some of the whites are good. And then you know which which ones do I like? Which wineries do I like? Um, this is an exploding industry, and climate change means you know this is a this is a rare silver lining for us for climate. Change change is going to make and you're going to be able to make wine in Scotland by 2080. <laughs> but I mean, um, uh, but you know, it's 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 really exciting because you can see it all growing right in front of your eyes here, and um, and so and you can see this industry being born, and 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 how's that going to change, and what's good and what's bad, and and you know who's doing what. I just you know I'm 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 a journalist. I'm into new things, but new things meeting new drinks is even more exciting. I would say though that like there's at least at least in America that there's like a lot of like myths about especially spirits that like older is always better more expensive is always better whether it's spirits or wine or beer and that's not true For sure. i mean it's it's what you you know it's more expensive you know the older whiskeys for instance because they've had to sell them for 20 30 years and they lose every year they lose a percent of alcohol to what's called the angel share to evaporation so i mean you're you're paying for all of this stuff but do I want to taste it? Sure. Will I like it? Not necessarily. And, and so when you go in, I mean, I know this is, this is good news and bad news. It's good news because you don't have to break the bank when you're buying a bottle. Like you might actually find something that you love that costs 15, $20. Right. But the, the bad news is that, you know, it's a lot harder because you have to try a lot of different things instead of just saying, I'll take the most expensive one. Or I'll take the oldest one. And, and that, you know, sometimes that is great. Sometimes it's not great, you know? So you know, I'd, I'd keep that in mind that it's, it's those things are, are, you know, they're, they're not necessarily a marker of quality or whether or not you'll like it. So, you know, don't, there's no, there should be no embarrassment about ordering something that's not the most expensive whiskey or the oldest one, because some of those are delicious. And really a lot of the distillers themselves prefer the younger whiskeys. It's the marketing people who like the older whiskeys <laughs> because they can sell for a lot more. And um, as our final question from our audience, I also wanted to ask you guys, what, are, um, in your opinion, is the best cocktail from your perspective? What is something that you'll always like go towards, like Ooh. as a co as a cocktail, whenever? I, um, I mean, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna like cheat a little bit, and I'm gonna say, you know, in, in many ways, cocktails are sort of like baking, right? It's a lot about formulas, like you know, you can. That's a great books. analogy. <laughs> Right. You see books at like the bookstore, right? And it's like 5,000 cocktails. And you're like, oh my God, how would I ever know how to make 5,000? There are, there are not 5,000 cocktails in the world, right? There are just a few formulas, right? And there are a lot of permutations on them. Some of them are important. Some of them are not so important. So like one formula that I love is the sour formula, right? So the sour formula usually is two parts alcohol, one part sour, which is fresh lime juice or fresh lemon juice. I cannot stress to you how important it is to use fresh juice. This will make your drinks taste like they're from a bar. This is, this is the greatest thing. If you take nothing away from this talk, please use fresh juice. Like whether you buy it from a fresh juice shop or the grocery store, or you juice it yourself, buy a cheap hang juicer, whatever kind of juicer, fresh juice is essential. And for the sour recipe, it's two parts alcohol, one part sour, fresh lime juice, lemon juice, and one part sweetener, whether it's, you know, basically simple syrup, which is just one part sugar, one part water or agave syrup. You put tequila in that and with lime, that's basically a margarita. You use rum and lime, that's a daiquiri. You know, you can make a French 75. If you use cognac or gin, you top it with gin with top it with champagne. I mean, basically the sour formula is one of these amazing formulas that gives birth to all of these different drinks and kind of like whatever you have in your house, like you can use it with the Negroni formula is also like that, which is one part gin, one part Campari, one part sweet vermouth. And when we say one part, it doesn't matter whether it's one ounce, half an ounce, two ounces, I mean, that would be a big drink, but like whatever it is, 
like, you know, whether or not you have a measuring device or not, you can use as long as it's the same. And then, you know, with the Negroni, you can use instead of gin, you can use bourbon, you can use tequila, you can use mezcal. I mean, it's a very flexible formula. So once you get that kind of, it's fun. I mean, it's, and once you get those formulas down, then it kind of unlocks this whole world of mixology. Um, last winter, we weren't allowed to meet indoors. So I got really into the old fashioned, but the warm version mm. of the old fashioned. So the warm old fashioned was a, was a, uh, uh, is a good winter drink. Um, we haven't talked about probably the most, um, you know, the period where drinking probably changed world history the most is the colonial period where distilled spirits come into their own because you can fit more alcohol into a smaller space on board a ship. And that has lots of impacts. They're used as a currency in the transatlantic slave trade, for example. And then you have the, the role of sugar and molasses, the leftover from sugar production being sent to, uh, to New England to make rum. And then the rum is sent back to the west coast of Africa to, as a currency and so forth and so forth. Um, as an echo of that is the mojito, weirdly. The mojito is the sort of... Um, modern descendant of grog um which is you know rum lime juice and uh, and sugar and grog was the drink that essentially ensured the supremacy of the british navy uh the reason that the brits won at trafalgar was that um they had vitamin c in their grog and the uh the um the it, it, the French and the Spanish all had lots of scurvy because they didn't have enough vitamin C. Uh, but I think that the the my favourite, my actual favourite, would probably still be the Negroni. Um, and actually, I like the kind of bastardised version of the Negroni, the Negroni Sbagliato, which means the Negroni got it wrong. Uh, and that's where you replace the gin with uh, with sparkling wine. And what I like about that is because you know a Negroni is pretty strong. You know, you're mixing you're mixing two things that are twenty five percent alcohol with something that's forty percent alcohol. The nice thing about the um, Sbagliato is that you're mixing those twenty five percent alcohol things with usually prosecco so something that's like 12 percent um and that means you can have two and uh the only thing is if you order a negroni spagliato in a very fancy um bar in italy they will refuse to serve it to you it's like ordering a cappuccino after after 11 in the morning it's just not done um, <laughs> because you're asking them to bastardize this beautiful creation so i remember being in notto in sicily and in, in uh, the most famous bar in notto so they could have a negroni spagliato and they're like no you nope. can't i'm bringing you a proper negroni <laughs> so that's probably that's probably my favorite oh. cheers you know i was never a big uh, negroni fan but um for people for you guys and for people at home um if you've never read the essay um negroni season by evelyn everlady um it is so funny it is about negronis um that's all i'll tell you but definitely look it up negroni season by evelyn everlady it's a fantastic and, and, funny and essay there's a whole history of like campari and, and the negroni the oxford companion that um you know, the editor uh, Dave Wanger works with our one of our contributors Leo Liucci from from Rome, and it's it's a fascinating history of both Campari and, and the drink itself. And I mean, it's it's one of those drinks. Twenty years ago, it would have been very hard to find, like in New York, and now it's everywhere. You know, it, it brings me great joy yeah. to walk down the street and see it on a chalkboard outside of a bar or restaurant advertising. There's like a Negroni place. Day now, isn't there? One oh. of the big drinks companies, was it it's Diageo, <laughs> whoever it is who makes Campari, Campari. they have like, oh, yeah, itself, right. So yeah. I remember going into a bar in San Francisco once and there was a sign saying, it's Negroni Day, in, in, like global I Negroni I think every day, day is Negroni <laughs> Day yeah, now, I, As far honest, as I'm but... concerned, it is, but that was <laughs> that was like 10 years ago and it was like, right, we're all yeah. having Negronis. <laughs> no, that it's, it's one of these, again, I mean, the old fashioned too, you talked about that, I mean, you know, you know, the old fashioned is literally the definition of a cocktail, right? It's spirits, sugar, water, and bitter. And in 1806, the first definition ever, you know, found and recorded in a newspaper was in upstate New York. And the, somebody had written into the editor and said, last week you used this word cocktail. What is that? And the editor basically said, well, a cocktail is, and it's what he gives is essentially the formula for an old fashioned. And then the old fashioned gives birth in, you know, the Manhattan and the Martini is sweet vermouth and dry vermouth come from Italy and France. And, you know, bartenders, I think, have a very, they're curious by their nature and they're putting in new ingredients and they're trying it. So essentially the old fashioned leads to the Martini, the old fashioned. And, you know, from there, you know, that's, you know, it sort of blows up. But, you know, the old fashioned itself, you know, for years it was very hard to find anywhere. And now, except in Wisconsin, where they make it in a very specific way with, you know, uh, seven up and brandy and stuff. But, you know, now, uh, you know, it's amazing to see yeah. the old fashioned on cocktail menus, you know, around the world, you know, and people drinking it in droves and, you know, people I never thought, you know, come up to me and ask about the old fashioned. It's like, uh, it, it's, it's like a dream. Uh, you know. um, well, thank you everyone at home for joining us tonight. 
Um, I want to do a toast with my last bit of Lambrusco. Thank you guys and everyone at home. Thank you so much for joining us and be sure to check out uh, Noah and Tom's history books on alcohol, wine, spirit, beers, and things like that. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. Cheers. Cheers. Take care, everybody.